Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we get to explore a 13th century fortified manor house that takes shape of a castle in mighty Northumberland and is a wonderful survival from the Middle Ages. It remains almost completely intact and is set in the beautiful woodlands with an interesting history to be explored. Having been raided, burnt and changed hands many times throughout its years, so join us as we wonder and enjoy a walk around Aden Castle. As we enter inside the castle, through the not so intimidating plain entrance and main gate, which it has to be mentioned had no gatehouse or barbican to defend besiegers, but what it did have was some openings for archers to try and ward off the attackers, but even the archers in their numbers wouldn't be able to keep up for long. It's here and inside the courtyard that you can see that Aden was a fortified manor home and not a fortress, but it was a manor house that would have been able to hold a lot of people. To get an understanding of the origins of Aden Castle, it was thanks to Robert de Rames, who was a wealthy Suffolk merchant who began construction of the house in 1296, at the end of an unusually long period of peace in the border regions. The building is naturally defended on one side by the steep valley of the Corburn, but it was otherwise unfortified. Unfortunately for de Rames, the building of his house coincided with a new period of conflict with Scotland, which led to frequent Scottish raids throughout the area. We firstly visit the stores and the stables of the castle. The doorways here are quite unusual as they have shouldered arches which was a typical characteristic shape for doorways built around the 1300s. These three interconnected rooms were built to hold the storage for the kitchens, just right above this room, but were later converted into stables and cow sheds, with feeding troughs for the animals and drains to carry the muck away. What's beautiful to see is the variety of stonework and the mason's works all across the doors. Passing then through to the elegant doorway of the inner courtyard, you get to experience how pretty this castle actually is. It shows you the decorative battlements and wall walk around the courtyard. Something to note is the roof lines that are cut into the wall above the stairs, which we're about to walk up. These stairs originally had a porch at the top, where the visitors would wait for admission into the hall. Where we are standing and looking around now, originally made of wood, but now with a stone is a screen that used to separate the hall on the left to the service rooms on the right. This room was the second kitchen, the second of three kitchens in the castle. This one would have been built pretty soon after the first. Robert de Rames was heavily involved in the fighting that broke out in the borders after 1296, and he needed many more men, both to follow him to war and also to defend his beautiful property. The original kitchen was too small to provide for an army of men, so he built this new one, still with easy access to the hall, and it was divided into two rooms which is easily indicated by the change in the floor levels. Most of the cooking took place in the second room, using seasonings that were stored in the cupboards that are cut into the walls that we can still see today. This large fireplace had its purpose for being so wide, they needed to be able to cook several things at once to make sure everybody was well fed. We then take a very short walk into the beautiful medieval hall. 
This hall was the social centre for the whole building, and the place where the Lord would often appear in public, especially when he was to entertain guests. As you can see with the layout, the Lord and his family would have sat at the far end, with a table extending across the hall and lit by windows on each side. More than likely the guests would have sat on tables, stretching down the hall from either end of the Lord's table. Interestingly though, there are no fireplaces here, but the warmth of this room would have come from a fire placed in the centre of the room, on a stone hearth. Looking down the hall towards the screen, you can just about make out the fireplace of a room above. This was originally a gallery, where the musicians would play. Inside this room and following from the Great Hall was the Lord's private apartments. Just stepping inside you can see and experience the grandeur that Robert wanted. This room was the upstairs solar, and these seats overlook the stunning views outside. But what's most notable from this room is the beautiful fireplace. Weirdly enough, the fireplace was originally set into the opposite side of the wall, but it was moved across the room from the later owners, the Carnabies, maybe with the hope that it might warm the hall on the other side. This room that we're now in would make sense to be the Lord's private bedchamber, again lit by windows, and by all accounts you could regard this room as a medieval ensuite. The wall at the far end with the stone shoot indicates that this was a latrine all inside the one room, but possibly would have had a screen or a partition wall, closing it off and maintaining privacy. This particular room I found really interesting to explore. It's the original kitchen. The fireplace stands where the oven once was, with the cupboard cut into the wall on the left. And more further left to this is a chute for getting rid of the nasty bits and the rubbish just next to the window. Also what I found particularly interesting was to see the coat of arms that was carved into the fireplace. This whole castle really does give me an enchanting vibe. In 1305, Robert obtained a licence to crenellate his property and set about improving the defences with the addition of battlements and a circuit of curtain walls. This came to a great use when on the 25th of March in 1306, Robert the Bruce seized the Scottish throne. Then on the 7th of July in 1307, Edward I of England died which led to events spanning over years of misery for the northern counties of England. As the Scots first drove the English out, and continued to loot, raid and burn everything in their path, it included Aden Castle. And in 1311, and again in 1312, Corbridge and the surrounding area were particularly raided by Bruce in person. Aden's sizeable walls may have well kept the enemy away on these particular occasions, but in 1315 there was just no escape. In Robert's absence, the castle had been commanded to buy Hugh de Gales, but was met by a battle from the Scots, and eventually he had to surrender with the result that the castle would be plundered and scorched. Aidan simply was just not strong enough to resist a mighty invading army. Two years later, Aidan suffered again, but this time through the English hands and through its trusted ally Hugh de Gales who was the same person who failed to defend it two years previous. 
Hugh and his followers seized Aden in December of 1317 and ransacked the building once again, but for this time for their timber, their linen, gold and silver, and their household goods. The castle went through many years of torment and terrible luck, constantly being attacked, and it gained a reputation to be an unlucky place to have lived, and became very difficult to rent, so a decision was made and the estate was put into the Ministry of Works Care in 1966, and then the English Heritage took over, and has since maintained it wonderfully. Downstairs in this series of rooms you can explore what's known as the downstairs solar and the other dwelling rooms. You can also see a model of the castle and how it would have looked back in the day. Seeing the sheer scale and size of the castle and its surroundings shows you how impressive it would have looked. Downstairs in this solar room, the chamber above would have been only accessible before the 19th century, with the ornate staircase leading to it. There are theories that this room would have acted as a retreat for the Lord's family in the winter time. The two windows in this room still survive and are from the 13th century. In the 16th century this room was converted into another kitchen by the Carnabies after they abandoned the original kitchen in the West Wing. For their cooking they installed this gorgeous fireplace in the corner but with a recess for baking bread at its left end. It was then later adapted in the 19th century after the castle had become a farmhouse by updating the fireplace with an iron stove. The southern end of this chamber was then used as the family dining room. I think my favourite feature inside this room is the beautiful fireplace with the decorated rows of carved bosses. All of these details, so intricate and unique, really make this castle so interesting to wander around. Just outside the inner courtyard is the castle's orchard, where the fruits and the veg would have been planted ready for cooking up a storm for the Lord and his guests. We also get the chance to head outside around the curtain wall of the south side of the castle, just to see the structure and also the views, and they really don't disappoint. Just outside these weathered castle walls lies whispered secrets that held tales of the past. People have believed that the castle was haunted, and its halls echoed with the footsteps of ghostly apparitions. One myth is of the castle's most scandalous ghostly resident, known as the Lady of Aden. The Lady was a young noble woman who had lived in the castle during the 16th century. Beautiful and captivating, she caught the hearts of many suitors, but was destined for a tragic fate. It was said that the Lady of Aden had fallen in love with a dashing knight from a rival noble family. Their forbidden love blossomed in secret, hidden within the castle's shadowy corridors. But when their affair was discovered, the knight was accused of treason, and the Lady of Aden was forbidden from ever seeing him again. Heartbroken, the Lady retreated to her chambers, consumed by grief and despair. In the dead of the night, a storm raged outside the castle, mirroring the turmoil within the Lady's heart. Unable to bear the pain any longer, she took her own life, vowing to forever haunt the castle and torment those who had torn her love apart. What an interesting story that continues to capture the attention of paranormal investigators over the years, who flock here in the hope of capturing the residents of the past.
So we really hope we've interested and encouraged you to take a trip to Aden Castle. For us, it was one that really stood out from our time here in Northumberland, and it's quite unknown which is surprising considering its turbulent history. We think this is a must-see and a must-do when visiting Northern England. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up button, consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and why not join in on the fun, become a channel member and get your say in what we do next, as well as being the first ones to see sneak peeks and supporting us in doing what we love sharing with you all. We want to say a big thank you to our channel members and to our Patreons. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.